part of the excitement of the house is being in heaven is they can't be in heaven. Politically incorrect, Thierry Chanko glories in the background. He was just talking about the Harrison Buck video. So let's get to it. Our own nation is led by a man who publicly and proudly proclaims his Catholic faith, but at the same time is delusional enough to make the sign of the cross during a pro-abortion rally. He has been so vocal in his support for the murder of innocent babies that I'm sure to many people, it appears that you can be both Catholic and pro-choice. He is not alone. From the man behind the COVID lockdowns to the people pushing dangerous gender ideologies onto the youth of America, they all have a glaring thing in common. They are Catholic. This is an important reminder that being Catholic alone doesn't cut it. My first problems with how Harrison Bucker gets into really the meat of what he's trying to say in here is how he starts this off. So he's talking about COVID and he lets COVID then trickle into the conversation about abortion and President Biden being a Catholic. But he doesn't mention in here that when COVID started, President Biden wasn't the current president. Donald Trump was the president. But this to me strikes me as a political speech. So he's not going to be attacking Donald Trump, even though Donald Trump was president during COVID. COVID started under Donald Trump. So if you're going to make the attack on COVID, then you have to also attack the president that COVID started under. But I think this kind of sets the stage for what Bucker is trying to do in here. So when I watched this for the first time, I felt like this was a political speech more than anything else. But let's keep going. And it while COVID might have played a large role throughout your formative years, it is not unique. Bad policies and poor leadership have negatively impacted major life issues. Things like abortion, IVF, surrogacy, euthanasia, as well as a growing support for degenerate cultural values and media all stem from the pervasiveness of disorder. Our own nation is led by a man who publicly and proudly proclaims his Catholic faith, but at the same time is delusional enough to make the sign of the cross during a pro-abortion rally. He has been so vocal in his support for the murder of innocent babies that I'm sure to many people, it appears that you can be both Catholic and pro-choice. He is not alone. From the man behind the COVID lockdowns to the people pushing dangerous gender ideologies onto the youth of America, they all have a glaring thing in common. They are Catholic. So... Again, to the COVID conversation, whenever we shut down during COVID, that was during Donald Trump's reign as president. If I'm not mistaken, and y'all may correct me, I believe that was early 2020. So that's Donald Trump. Plus, he's also now making this critique of Biden on abortion. And look, I don't agree with the way that either side talks about abortion. So that's the Republican side and their perspective on it. But that's also my party, the Democratic Party, and the way that we talk about abortion. So I have no problem with him having a critique on abortion policy in the United States. I do think, though, it's disingenuous whenever you're not handing out blame fairly. So you're trying to make a point about President Biden, and then he's also including Anthony Fauci, which I'm assuming because he's saying it, that it's true, but that Anthony Fauci is a, a Catholic. So he's making this critique of Catholics, but he's only making critiques of Catholics that are Democrats. He's not making critiques of all Catholics or Catholics that agree with him. And staying in it. As members of the church founded by Jesus Christ, it is our duty and ultimately privilege to be authentically and unapologetically Catholic. Don't be mistaken, even, with, even within the church, people in polite Catholic circles will try to persuade you to remain silent. There even was an award-winning film called Silence, made by a fellow Catholic, wherein one of the main characters, a Jesuit priest, abandoned the church and as an apostate, when he died, is seen grasping a crucifix, quiet and unknown to anyone but God. As a friend of Benedictine College, His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron said in his review of the film, it was exactly what the cultural elite want to see in Christianity, private, hidden away, and harmless. I do think there's a specific momentum against Christianity. And I think the arguments against that actually come from the fact that 
Christians have been leaders in the United States for really the bulk of time that the United States has existed. So people are not going to be looking at Christianity the same way that they look at Judaism or Islam because the leaders of the United States have been primarily Christians. Our Catholic faith has always been countercultural. Our Lord, along with countless followers, were all put to death for their adherence to her teachings. The world around us says that we should keep our beliefs to ourselves whenever they go against the tyranny of diversity, equity, and inclusion. He, as someone that's a Christian, I feel like you are stooping so low to put Christianity, in his case, putting Catholicism on the same level as DEI. Is that really the fight that's taking place right now? DEI versus Christianity? It just seems to me, again, there's going to be a theme here. I feel like it's a political speech. He's not really advocating for Catholicism. He's not really advocating for masculinity. He's making a political speech and he's weaving in a lot of that other stuff to make his point about how he feels about politics. Because now, unfortunately, truth is in the minority. Congress just passed a bill where stating something as basic as the biblical teaching of who killed Jesus could land you in jail. Not true. And this is my problem whenever you have people that are talking about things that they aren't um, well versed in or haven't studied enough or haven't done the research. What happened is there is an anti-anti-Semitism bill that passed in the House, but it didn't pass in the Senate. It still needs to be taken up in the Senate. But another piece of that, too, is in the House, who is leading the House? It's the Republican Party. It's not the Democratic Party. So whenever he's making these attacks, he's not, one, he's not being accurate. If you say Congress passed a bill, it means that now that bill should be taken up to the president. And if it's signed, then it becomes law. That means that the House and Senate passed the bill. But that's not what took place here. The House passed the bill with Republican leadership. The, the majority of people that actually signed the bill are Republicans. Number two, when you go look at the bill, and I have the bill up right here, it's called the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act of 2023. It says nothing about what it's talking about. It's identifying that there's been discrimination among Jews and anti-Semitism is on the rise. And that they're adapting the definition of anti-Semitism from the IHRA. And the IHRA is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. But there's nowhere in the bill that says that if you identify who killed Jesus, that you'll be taken in prison. But there's a third piece here. And it goes back to why I feel like this is a political speech. The Republican Party runs the House right now. Speaker Mike Johnson is a Republican. And so... There was a Republican that wrote this bill, and if I'm not mistaken, the majority of the folks that signed on to this bill and said yes are Republicans. But he's not stating that. When you hear about his critiques, when you hear his political critiques in this video, they're all directed towards Democrats. It's a theme in here. This is a political speech. He's trying to make a point about who he agrees with politically and who he feels is attacking his Catholicism politically, and that's only Democrats in his view. The chaos of the world is unfortunately reflected in the chaos in our parishes and sadly in our cathedrals, too. our cathedrals too. As we saw during the pandemic, too many bishops were not leaders at all. They were motivated by fear, fear of being sued, fear of being removed, fear of being disliked. They showed by their actions, intentional or unintentional, that the sacraments don't actually matter. Because of this, countless people died alone without access to the sacraments and it's a tragedy we must never forget. This is obviously a very controversial aspect of the COVID lockdowns and the response from public leaders in terms of how they feel like they should be leading their congregations um, or places of worship or even elected officials in terms of how they should be leading their state. But he's admitting here that people died because of COVID. And so when he says millions of, or when he says that people have died and they weren't able to take their sacrament. It's admitting that people died because of COVID. So uh, I think that he should have a little bit more grace to the elected officials and the bishops that 
had to navigate something that we haven't navigated in this country, if I'm not mistaken, since the Spanish flu, where you have folks that are leading a group of people and they're not sure how to respond. Okay, if I end up having mass, but it's a super spreader event, people get COVID and they die. Do I want to be responsible for that? Am I responsible for that? But if I do that and I close down mass, then now on the flip side, people aren't able to take in their sacraments. In-person worship isn't able to take place. I'm a huge fan of being able to do things in person. So it affected me in my life as well. But I understood both sides. It wasn't something that was very easy. And here, I feel like, Latin, you know, no pun intended, that he's playing Monday morning quarterback. If he was in the position of those bishops at that time, hearing about how, man, Sally died a couple of days ago from COVID, or this family is now all in the hospital because of COVID. It's very easy to talk about it now in 2024, saying what you wouldn't, wouldn't have done. It's a whole different thing to be back then in those situations, feeling like, look, I don't want to be the reason why a whole group of people are dying. That's something that even... As a manager, whenever I was working in D.C., it's something that I had to think through. Should we bring people in the office? Should we people allow people to stay at home? That's a very real thing. So I don't think that Harrison is being, I don't think that Harrison is having enough grace here to leaders that are having to deal with these tough decisions. As Catholics, we can look to so many examples of heroic shepherds who gave their lives for their people and ultimately the church. We cannot buy into the lie that the things we experienced during COVID were appropriate. Over the centuries, there have been great wars, great famines, and yes, even great diseases, all that came with a level of lethality and danger. But in each of those examples, church leaders leaned into their vocations and ensured that their people received the sacraments. It's a, it's a, fair, I mean, it's a fair point. I can't refute that. That's a fair point. If your angle is... Look, the sacrament should always be offered regardless of what's going on in the world. That's fair. I just think that you have to have a little bit more understanding and grace to folks that are maybe looking at it from a different perspective, where it's, I don't want to put people in harm's way. And so that's something, Harrison can make that point, no problem. Again, I understand both sides of it. I get what he's saying. I just think that he might need to have more grace to leaders that we're thinking about, just not wanting to have people dying on their watch. Our bishops are not politicians, but shepherds. So instead of fitting in the world by going along to get along, they too need to stay in their lane and lead. I say all of this not from a place of anger as we get the leaders we deserve, but this does make me reflect on staying in my lane and focusing on my own vocation and how I can be a better father and husband and live in the world, but not be of it. Focusing on my vocation while praying and fasting for these men will do more for the church than me complaining about her leaders. That's the thing, though. You're criticizing the bishops for doing the exact thing that you're doing. You're saying that they should stay in their lane, but why don't you stay in your lane and just kick a football for the Kansas City Chiefs? That part I don't understand. Bishops feel a responsibility to lead their congregations in the way that they feel led to. I don't always agree with those ways, but... To tell them basically to shut up and dribble or to shut up and kick a football, it's the same exact thing that you're doing. You're up here at Benedictine College talking about politics, talking about health, talking about Catholicism. Those are not the things that you make your money off of. That's not your day job, yet you're up here talking about it, yet you're criticizing bishops for getting involved in these type of conversations. And you're criticizing them for getting involved in conversations that pertain to them. They have a congregation they want to lead their congregation in a way that they feel like is honoring the Lord. This doesn't make much sense to me. It's hypocritical for Harrison to be talking about basically telling the bishops, shut up and preach whenever he's up here and people could tell him, just shut up and kick a football. Because there seems to be so much confusion coming from our leaders, there needs to be concrete examples for people to look to in places like Benedictine, a little Kansas college, built high on a bluff above the Missouri River, are showing the world how an ordered, Christ-centered existence is the recipe for success. You need to look no further than the examples all around this campus, where over the past 20 years, enrollment has doubled, construction and revitalization are a constant part of life, and people, the students, the faculty and staff, are thriving. 
This didn't happen by chance. In a deliberate movement to embrace traditional Catholic values, Benedictine has gone from just another liberal arts school with nothing to set it apart to a thriving beacon of light and a reminder to us all that when you embrace tradition, success, worldly and spiritual, will follow. If I was a Benedictine College alum, I would be hot as fish grease. The fact that he's saying here, until the university accepted tradition, it was basically worthless and useless to get a degree from there. And he has a lot of balls to say that doing a commencement speech at that college with alums that are sitting there and listening to him say that. So that's number one. But number two, the idea that tradition or embracing tradition equals worldly success, that to me goes against everything that I see in my Bible. There's nothing that ensures worldly success. So it's a false promise that he's given those students. They're saying that, well, look, because the university embraced tradition, that the worldly success came as a result of that. That's not true. There are so many people that hold on to traditional values, yet don't have what we would call worldly success. And I think the Bible speaks to that, that we shouldn't be looking for our treasure on earth, our treasures in heaven. For the ladies present today, congratulations on an amazing accomplishment. You should be proud of all that you have achieved to this point in your young lives. I want to speak directly to you briefly because I think it is you, the women, who have had the most diabolical lies told to you. How many of you are sitting here now about to cross this stage and are thinking about all the promotions and titles you are going to get in your career? Some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world, but I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. <laughs> and he gets, into, he gets into a whole deal here. But how are you making that assumption that you're sitting at a college graduation and you're telling the women there that work their butt off to be able to get their degree that I'm not actually looking most forward to using the degree that I just earned, but that I'm looking forward to being a wife and a mother and being engaged with my husband in marriage. It's just an interesting, it's, he has an interesting perspective on this. So I'm excited to kind of get into this, but to me, the diabolical lies, it's just a, it's a whole lot, man. I'm on this stage today and able to be the man I am because I have a wife who leans into her vocation. I'm beyond blessed with the many talents God has given me, but it cannot be overstated that all of my success is made possible because a girl I met in band class back in middle school would convert to the faith, become my wife, and embrace one of the most important titles of all, Paul Maker. So part of the problem that I feel we have in society is we have two extremes. So people that, let's say, take your independent women that are grinding, that are working hard, were able to get degrees, and now are using those degrees, we put them in one box. And then now you have the other box. She's a homemaker. She's at the home. She's taking care of the family. And we pit, we pit these two against each other. Whenever there's a whole lot of value, you know, if, the, if, if a woman or a wife wants to do that, but to say that that's the most important part of a woman or that that's the thing that a woman should be looking towards being is a homemaker is completely dismissing all the women that are independent, that have gotten their degrees that may not want to be a wife or may not want to be a mother and want to focus in on their career or want to be a wife and want to be a mother, but also value their career. The idea that he's putting, he's phrasing it that way. There are a lot of assumptions that are made here. Number one, that every woman is able to have the opportunity of being a wife and a mother. It's just not true. It's not true. Number two, that families are set up to where the woman could be a homemaker if she wanted to. The majority of families in the United States have to have two parents working right now to be able to make ends meet. Some of you may go on to lead successful careers in the world, but I would venture to guess that the majority of you are most excited about your marriage and the children you will bring into this world. I can tell you that my beautiful wife, Isabel, would be the first to say that her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. 
I'm on this stage today and able to be the man I am because I have a wife who leans into her vocation. I'm beyond blessed with the many talents God has given me, but it cannot be overstated that all of my success is made possible because a girl I met in band class back in middle school would convert to the faith, become my wife, and embrace one of the most important titles of all, Paul Maker. I feel like people are going to say I'm nitpicking. When he says all of his success is attributed to his wife making the decision to be a homemaker, that to me, does, it just doesn't sit well with me. Because I know the hours, I was a college athlete and an okay college athlete at best. And I know the hours that I put in to be able to get the success that I had on the collegiate level, let alone one of the best kickers in NFL history, playing for the Kansas City Chiefs, multiple Super Bowl winner, saying that all of his success is attributed to his wife becoming a homemaker. So all the hours that he put in on the field to be able to make sure that he can kick a field goal between those uprights. I, again, I may be nitpicking. I just don't think that that's accurate. And when you say that, then it takes away from all the work that you did putting yourself in a position to be able to kick that football and make those field goals. And then the other flip side to that is when all your success is attributed to your wife being a homemaker, that means that if my wife ends up becoming a homemaker, then I can expect to have the same amount of success that you had as a, as a kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs because all your success is attributed to that. None of it is the work that you put in, the hours that you put in on the field to make sure that you can do your job well. I have leaned into my vocation as a husband and father and as a man. To the gentlemen here today, part of what plagues our society is this lie that has been told to you that men are not necessary in the home or in our communities. As men, we set the tone of the culture. And when that is absent, disorder, dysfunction, and chaos set in. This absence of men in the home is what plays a large role in the violence we see all around the nation. Other countries do not have nearly the same absentee father rates as we find here in the U.S., and a correlation could be made in their drastically lower violence rates as well. There is a masculinity problem that we have in the United States. There was an overcorrection, in my opinion, that took place as we've been fighting against toxic masculinity, which is something that we should be fighting against, 100%. But that overcorrection now has caused for a lot of men to feel like, well, I want to be strong. I want to be a protector of my house. I want to make sure that things are okay. And there's a, a machismo, for lack of a better term, that men have that feel they feel like they can't tap into. Not all machismo is toxic. I think that there's value in being able to have men to feel like, well, I'm strong. I want to protect people. If I go outside right now and I talk to, let's say I talk to 10 women, I can guarantee you that out of the 10 women that I talk to, if they're in a difficult situation and there's a woman and there's a man right there with them and they need someone to protect them, eight out of 10 women are going to say, can I have the man to help protect me in this situation? And so I don't think it's a negative thing for men to feel like they should be protected or for men to feel like they should be strong. I think that we have to put things in their proper place. Being a man means, yes, you can be a protector. Yes, you can fight for things that you believe in. Yes, you can have an opinion. But that shouldn't then lead to you now being an oppressor and not allowing women to also have their view on things. And so we have to put things in the proper place. The second piece, fatherlessness thing. He's just flat out wrong. Flat out wrong. And let's look at the stats. So when you look at fatherlessness in the world, the United States leads the world in fatherlessness. But another country that is also up there in fatherlessness, another two countries, Norway and Sweden. Norway and Sweden are two countries that sit with the United States in having the highest level of fatherlessness in the world. Yet their violence rates are extremely low. Norway and Sweden are two countries that have one of the lowest crime rates in the world. But now let me give you another side of it. The United States is one of the top countries as it pertains to fatherlessness. Costa Rica is one of the countries that has one of the lowest rates of fatherlessness. Yet, 
Costa Rica has a higher crime rate than the United States. So when he says this, and again, this is why I believe that this is a political speech, because the stats that he's using and the political points he's using, they're not right. And so for you to go up here and say all of this stuff and not have stats and proof behind it means that you're just trying to make a point. You're less concerned about actually being right and saying the truth. You're just trying to make your political points and make your digs at the people that disagree with you. And another piece to this, before we keep playing the tape, to say that because you don't have a father basically means that you're going to be violent because that's the correlation that he's making. The majority of people that don't have fathers aren't violent. We have to get out of the mindset of saying certain things that aren't true because we want them to be true. Because you don't have a father doesn't make you someone that's more likely to be violent. The majority of people that don't have fathers aren't violent. The same way that the majority of people that live in low-income neighborhoods aren't violent as well. So the idea that poverty means that you're going to be violent isn't true. What you must remember is that life is about doing the small things well, setting yourself up for success, and surrounding yourself with people who continually push you to be the best version of you. I say this all the time, that iron sharpens iron. It's a great reminder that those closest to us should be making us better. If your friend group is filled with people who only think about what you're doing next weekend and are not willing to have those difficult conversations, how can they help sharpen you? It's a good point that he's making in the second piece of that. It's important to have friends that have different perspectives, different political views, and just have a different background. That is something that allows you to be able to see things from a number of different angles. I know that my message today had a little less fluff than is expected for these speeches. But I believe that this audience and this venue is the best place to speak openly and honestly about who we are and where we all want to go, which is heaven. Make no mistake, you are entering into mission territory in a post-God world, but you were made for this. And with God by your side and a constant striving for virtue within your vocation, you too can be a saint. Christ is king to the heights. In conclusion, I think that Harrison Bucker here did a disservice to a lot of people. He did a disservice to women. He did a disservice to people that don't agree with him politically. He did a disservice to bishops and elected officials and public leaders that had to figure out things on the fly in a situation that they had never dealt with before. And so whenever we have people that end up having these opportunities of being able to speak in public, that's not something to be taken lightly. I think it's important that when you go up here and you, you say these things, that there's some truth behind it. That you can say, look, violence is as a result of this, and this is the data to prove that I'm right or wrong. Instead of just saying this stuff, I shouldn't be able to sit here and go now and dig up all of the things that he was saying. And wait a second, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. There's a responsibility that we have whenever we're in these spaces to tell the truth, but to also make sure that People understand that because I have a perspective, it doesn't mean that it's always right. It's a perspective that within my context could be the right perspective, but it doesn't mean that you also have to take on that perspective. This is our first episode of Politically Incorrect with Thierry Chenko. You can find us on all social media platforms, YouTube, and also sign up on our Patreon.